je to, no, jasně. což to neumí. Aha. Takže to bude se muset nějak udělat přes asi Bluetooth. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Tak to bude ještě zajímavé. Počkej, čověče. Enduro. Já zkusím zavolat. No tady zrovna uh, Ale... Jan Hořeňovský. Jo, no, Když mi to pošlete na e-mail, tak, tak já se přihlásím pak do účtu. A, Aha, a je to...
prima Hi everyone. Um, in every conference, the second day is the most demanding one, especially after some of us partied last night. So, uh, you know, go easy on us. On the other hand, it is my great pleasure today to introduce uh, Jiří Přibáň, uh, professor um, of law and sociology from uh, the University of uh, in Cardiff of, of Cardiff. Um, so, as you know, uh, our uh, guest, uh, Gaspar Miklos Tamás, could not make it for health reasons, so we decided to kind of shift the structure of the program a bit. And here we are, 9.30 in the morning, with our roundtable round about uh, Jiří's new book. Um, so, the structure of this is as follows. Um, Professor Přibáň will talk for about 30 minutes about, you know, the basic uh, themes of his new book. And then this lineup of scholars will ask questions. B uh, it does not mean that the audience would uh, be excluded from asking questions. Quite on the contrary. We were hoping that, you know, having summoned this stellar lineup, of our colleagues might inspire you to actually start asking questions yourself. So it's despite the size of the room and the format, we were hoping uh, this to be quite uh, informal an event. Um, so let me say a couple of things about uh, Iri and the book and the conference, and I won't take much of your time, I promise. Um, his book, uh, Constitutional Imaginaries, A Theory of European Societal Constitutionalism, um, is an important book, I think, um, uh, and for a number of reasons. Constitutional imaginaries is a is a quite recent a term, I believe, and it is one which has many positive practical consequences for our ability to describe um, the situation in Europe, what is going on with the European project, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Why? Um, I believe that constitutional imaginaries um, provide a platform an important platform on which different scholars from different disciplines can meet and come together, think about the, the current issues and discuss them in a language that allows them to communicate effectively. You know, this is also an interdisciplinary forum and you know yourselves how important it is and how difficult it sometimes is to find a common language. Um, his book is brilliant, even though uh, for me it was difficult read uh, because it is a very uh, sometimes technical language, but at the same time, there is a certain lightness in his style which makes up for the difficult uh, technical stuff. Um, uh, Professor Přibáň, not only being a native of this law school, is also someone who has been not just contributing, but also helping to shape the discourse of constitutionalism in Europe for the past, I'm sorry to say, 20, and more years, <laughs> and he has become one of the most uh, visible voices in Europe and especially here um, in the Czech Republic. Um, also what is important, and this kind of is a follow-up on Albina's presentation yesterday, he also carries the spirit of 1989, if I may say so. He graduated in 1989, he was a part of the entire movement, and I think his philosophy and his book um, shows this, his, his concerns, the themes and topics that he considers to be interesting. So, the floor is yours, Jiří. Always difficult to adjust after Petr's presentation, so I'm lowering uh, the floor significantly, and uh, thank you a lot for uh, reminding me how 
old I am, and uh, uh, it's uh, because I remembered this uh, very room, uh, which still had the banister around, and our old uh, late uh, professor of legal theory, he got so he he started leaning on the banister and then he ended up stuck in it and fireman uh, unit had to come and rescue him yes so this is one of famous stories about this building this room and uh, it's a great privilege and great pleasure for me to be back uh, it's odd uh, to be speaking in English here, uh, but it's absolutely wonderful and uh, moving uh, moment because this is the first academic presentation that I'm giving live uh, rather than online uh, since uh, the lockdowns. So, and it's so wonderful to see so many faces of people I consider close friends, critical colleagues, and uh, uh, wonderful community. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm almost tempted to say that uh, this network, uh, which is a very subversive network of young scholars who take on institutional layouts and uh, um, uh, structures of uh, Center East European Academia, and you know what I'm talking about, this last medieval uh, system of uh, professors, docents, and assistants. We know who does the work, we know who gets the credit, it, and we know that this must change, and uh, uh, so um, I always uh, considered uh, this network uh, to be uh, an, uh, a work in progress. Yeah, and uh, uh, um, uh, I unfortunately I couldn't join yesterday, but I uh, watched uh, the most interesting plenary by Albena. And uh, uh, I really was um, uh, impressed uh, by these uh, 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 concluding remarks on how Havel was being read by the Green Movement uh, in, Bulgaria, in Bulgaria in the late 80s, and uh, um, uh, how these forces of the system and forces of life. Uh, if you read uh, uh, parts of Power of the Powerless, uh, it's uh, almost like uh, um, a take on Habermasian search for a life world. Yeah? And uh, is there a possibility of the life world? Uh, and I believe we have to radicalize the question uh, um, uh, because um, Habermas, uh, Habermas's project uh, is uh, very noble, but uh, the life world, uh, is there one or more life worlds? And my main question is, what is the voice of environment? And uh, can the voice of environment be more than cognitive voice for us, a source of learning, is it some normative externality to which we can uh, um, return? And, uh, um, uh, and those of you who know bits and pieces of my work, you know that I um, uh, follow uh, systems theory, autopoetic systems theory, uh, but uh, in a critical manner. And... Um, uh, more than, yeah, it was more than 25 years ago, or exactly 25 years ago, uh, I, it was my first trip to the International Institute for the Sociology of Law in Onyati, and I met uh, the mm, most distinguished sociologist, uh, Volkmar Gessner, who asked me, in a very German-like way, what are you reading, Yiri? And I was a young scholar, I said, well, I'm reading Luhmann and Habermas, and he made uh, an important uh, comment. He said, you, you don't have enough time to read both, you have to choose. <laughs> and uh, this was the first operation of selection, selectivity. I opted for Luhmann, but I always stayed in touch with Habermas. Yeah? Uh, the question is, uh, obviously for Luhmann, uh, critical theory uh, cannot, be uh, uh, cannot be found in Frankfurt anymore. 
We have to move uh, from um, uh, the idea of critical reason or communicative reason uh, to uh, the ration uh, uh, rationality of society. And there are more rationalities in society. But um, my old question, and this book is uh, the final part of my loose trilogy, which was started by legal symbolism, 2007, followed up by sovereignty in post-sovereign society in 2015, and this is the last part because it doesn't make to uh, it doesn't make sense to uh, publish monographs anymore. So it's uh, rather than focusing on another monograph, I decided to complete this long time endeavor in constitutional semantics. And uh, um, if the question of uh, legal symbolism was uh, uh, how come that law functions, but at the same time it represents what is beyond it. Yeah? So uh, symbolic rationality, which uh, is not directly linked to the functionality of law. And of course, uh, as I say, behind every general idea, there is an individual experience. And for me, this was the experience. Yesterday, when I was talking about the experience of the 80s, the experience of the 90s was that uh, uh, um, uh, we all were building constitutional democracy and we all wanted to become citizens and Europeans and it had an important symbolic value. And uh, of course, 20 years on, we are disenchanted, uh, but still this power of symbolism somehow um, um, uh, sticks to us. And uh, second, uh, uh, the question of sovereignty in uh, post-sovereign society was led by another simple question. How come that we live in European society, in global society, which, uh, in which political and legal sovereignty um, uh, has less and l or more uh, increasingly limited uh, and self-referential character, but at the same time, it's increasingly used by different, um, uh, in different contexts, political, legal, societal, economic, as we know. And just this morning, I was traveling because, of course, uh, um, I, we, we, uh, I, I do not live in uh, Prague. Uh, I live in provinces. Uh, so coming from the periphery to the city center, uh, you uh, cannot uh, ignore billboards because there is a for, uh, coming election and uh, there is a promise of our prime minister to protect us from all illegal migrants, illegal migrants. So we extremely value all Ukrainians and Vietnamese who work hard, but those who are out there, the danger, the external danger, which is, uh, yeah, I'll protect protect you. Um, yes, of course, it's Orban light, but uh, um, it's uh, interesting how uh, uh, this uh, uh, promise of sovereignty still is with us. Constitutional imaginaries is an attempt at uh, synthesizing some themes and generalizing them and turning them into a social theory. So I have a few slides. Uh, and uh, um, uh, I, because this is a very uh, highly knowledge uh, uh, um, uh, audience, uh, I will uh, theorize a little bit here. Um, uh, the first theorization is uh, uh, the imaginary uh, self of society. It's interesting how society imagines itself as unity, as self, but at the same time it operates through functionally differentiated systems. And uh, uh, there is a specific paradox, there is a specific paradox uh, um, uh, that uh, modern society is functionally differentiated and at the same time constitutes its unity as difference, but at the same time as differences as unity. 
So, okay, oh, wonderful. Uh, thank you. Um, oh, <laughs> okay. I, you can tell I'm not the high tech person. Uh, I even cannot tell which computer to use. Um, so, um, uh, obviously, there is a lot uh, written uh, lately on constitutional imaginaries. And it's interesting because um, this work has been in gestation for uh, some years. Um, and in uh, 2018, I published uh, the first article on this called Constitutional Imaginaries and uh, Their Legitimation in Journal of Law and Society. And uh, it's interesting, it's um, uh, uh, um, because obviously nobody can say who is the inventor. We are all inspired uh, by either Castoriadis or Taylor. It's very simple. So you go uh, in the direction of Castoriadis and Lefort uh, or, and, and critical theory. Um, uh, or you follow much uh, a more subtle, less speculative, less normative, nevertheless uh, sociologically informed uh, uh, idea of imagined communities, Benedict Anderson, and uh, especially Charles Taylor's um, uh, philosophical notion of modern social imaginaries. It's interesting how Taylor published the book of uh, lectures in the late 1990s, uh, but at the same time, um, uh, later on when he did his secular age, he used this uh, whole concept of imaginaries as basically a hermeneutical tool how to uh, analyze uh, secularization process. So a big question of uh, not just philosophy, but uh, modern social sciences. Uh, okay. So, uh, what can systems theory um, uh, tell us about the function of imaginaries? Uh, obviously, um, uh, Luhmann, um, uh, 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 Luhmann's concept of autopoetic systems um, uh, uh, is, uh, and then elaborated uh, by Gunther Teubner in the context of societal constitutions. Uh, uh, what we learn there is uh, um, uh, that exactly this imaginary unity of society as differentiated by different social systems. Um, it reformulates the problem of uh, legitimation and transvaluation of values in the systems of positive law and politics. And the basic question is, what is the function of these imaginaries, of these symbols, of symbolic legislation? Uh, Bart and uh, um, other colleagues at uh, um, uh, Freie, University, uh, uh, Freie University of Amsterdam have been long uh, engaged in studying and uh, examining uh, symbolic law, symbolic legislation for, for a long time. So what is the function of these symbols, of these imaginaries? And uh, clearly, uh, they transform the plurality of social immanence and differentiated societal forces into the community of transcendental values and deals. Yes, it is a it is, it is inspired by Nietzsche's process of transvaluation of values, because what is the process of legitimation? You translate immanence into something which can have validity beyond momentary operation. So uh, imaginaries actually tell us which values are important, eternal, and these eternal clauses in constitutions, we know they are only immanent and only temporary, but we still pretend they are eternal clauses. So imaginaries, this is, for instance, the imaginary of this, uh, uh, of this uh, Václav Bělohradský, uh, um, a prominent uh, Czech uh, philosopher and sociologist, uh, and uh, uh, yeah, uh, 
think, a great source of inspiration for me, and uh, uh, his, uh, his work has been highly influential as regards legitimation and uh, legitimacy and legality. Uh, but uh, 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 so uh, uh, when, we, when we talk about this transvaluation of values, uh, he was uh, having a lecture on uh, the substantive core of democratic constitution. For, uh, this substantive core of constitutions, which we know from post-war Germany, post-war Austria, and uh, in last 10 years, we know that Czech constitution has this substantive core, uh, um, which is uh, 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 related to the Czech or uh, Central European colleagues, you know the Melchak case. The Melchak case established uh, uh, the substantive core of the Czech constitution. We know it's uh, just an imaginary, but it has serious implications. Uh, it, it is how the legal power, the power of legality and the power of constitutionality operates in the Czech constitutional system. One of the mysteries uh, of uh, the Melchak case is that uh, politicians, rather than going gung-ho against the constitutional court at the time, uh, so, uh, they expressed their bitterness, they expressed their disagreements, and they accepted it. And you wonder, what is behind this functionality? Is it the imaginary of the legalist tradition, which is uh, incorporated into uh, which dates back to the Habsburg era, which is incorporated into Czechoslovak constitution and which has certain continuity in so many discontinuities. I'm coming uh, to the uh, final parts and I know I have to finish. Uh, so very quickly, uh, uh, imaginaries have societal power because they have the power to translate immanent claims as transcendental values. So one day you say that uh, family is untouchable, uh, that the marriage is for men and women only, and in five years you say, uh, well, uh, we have to celebrate the gay marriage, and you teach the whole world that they have to celebrate the gay marriage. This is the example of European, uh, many European countries, whenever it comes to gay rights, very much appreciated, but very much turned into a power and tool of um, um, uh, uh, pressure on those who don't fit into the form as if one size fits all. I can give you another example, even more striking. It took to France up until 1981 to abolish the capital punishment. Two years later, the Rome Protocol is uh, um, um, uh, adopted for the Council of Europe. And ever since the 1980s, European countries go around the world and preach that you are not a civilized nation if you have a capital punishment. Okay, so let's, this is a, 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 a conference of critically minded people. Let's remind us uh, uh, hypocritical approaches of European lawyers and politicians. Um, final bit, um, the imaginary of uh, topos ethnos nomos has been um, in uh, um, uh, a core um, uh, imaginary of modern constitutionalism. Yes, it dates back to uh, um, the ancient times, but in modernity, topos is the nation state, sovereign is, uh, um, ethnos here is uh, not necessarily ethnic nation, it's the nation living on that territory, uh, um, and nomos is, it's governed by one set of. 
However, we know that these imagine, constitutional imaginaries can operate in legal systems and legal order which are not based by um, uh, territorial constitutions. We know societal constitutions are constitutions which are sectoral, uh, functional, and uh, legal regimes constituted. Global health law would be one example. Global sports law would be another example. Uh, for instance, uh, we know uh, the football scandal with FIFA and, uh, um, uh, and uh, there was a cartoon during the FIFA corruption scandal. There was a, even one cartoon which was, uh, I don't know whether it was New Yorker or uh, where, yeah, that uh, two gentlemen walking along and says, yes, money was a great and noble idea, but then football got involved. Yeah? It's, uh, 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 and, uh, and these, uh, um, these uh, uh, um, uh, developments of law beyond the state, global law, show that we have imaginaries uh, which are beyond nomos, topos, ethnos. And let me stop there. One example would be European constitutional imaginaries. And the book is basically about these European constitutional imaginaries, which are informed uh, by, um, uh, obviously, administrative calculemus. Uh, a calculemus is an enlightenment idea of how you can measure, calculate, and uh, rationally organize and administer modern society long tradition of the French Enlightenment, uh, uh, today uh, practiced by uh, uh, many transnational governance theories. Um, obviously, um, uh, economic con uh, imaginary of imperium, uh, um, not empire, but imperium uh, of uh, uh, the affluence and prosperity. And uh, uh, for us lawyers to framing imaginaries uh, of European uh, constitutionalism are imaginary of pluralism. Uh, it's not a pluribus unum, it's um, uh, uh, the modern statehood, it's the other way around. We can operate only through pluralism, but tell it to uh, judges uh, at uh, the European Court of Justice, which is increasingly accumulating power without authority, and uh, I'm sorry to say so, but uh, these tensions can be very successfully exploited as they have been just by constitutional tribunal in Poland, because the judicial dialogue is a great idea, but it's not practiced. Yeah? And when you listen to people like uh, Kern Leonards, uh, uh, you get a lot of preaching, but very little listening. Yeah? Uh, when, whenever they talk even to national uh, constitutional court judges. And, uh, uh, and obviously, um, uh, this uh, uh, very naive uh, liberal idea is that, oh yes, German constitutional court judges are just conservatives stuck in old national imaginaries and uh, Europe is moving elsewhere. No, it's a question of legitimation. And legitimation can be achieved only through pluralism, but pluralism has to be practiced and lived. It has to be living law, not just law in books or law in uh, theoretical books. And finally, uh, and here I'm going to stop because we might have a discussion about it, imaginary of um, uh, uh, communitas, and uh, um, here I argue in the last chapter, I argue that um, there's nothing wrong with populism. Uh, uh, it's, a it's a political, as long as it's a political style. Uh, you have to do a look at the substance, at the agenda of populists, but uh, uh, every, popu uh, every Democrat and every politician in democracy has to have a populist streak. And uh, without populism, there is no, no democracy without populism, but uh, populism can um, uh, dismantle democracy, as we know. However, uh, I am completely, um, I completely agree with those scholars, uh, especially, um, I didn't know that, uh, for instance, Calypso Nicolaitis uh, was a young radical political theorist.
theorist, uh, but her idea of democracy, European democracy, when um, the peoples come and uh, legitimize together through mobilization uh, is, I think, topical, important, and uh, adding to European constitutional imaginaries beyond topos, nomos, and ethnos. Thank you very much. I was instructed how to get this started, but oh, okay, already. Now we're going to have a panel discussion. Um, of course, we have somehow synchronized between us, so it's kind of pre rehearsed discussion that is supposed to reflect um, the structure of Yeji's book and also the themes which we consider to be important for our conference because his book is rich and there is just no way for us to go through all the uh, ideas in it. So um, I hope this works. So I will give floor to Rafael Manco. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me to join this uh, discussion panel. Uh, I would like to start from saying that the concept of the imaginary is now making a big career in legal scholarships. We are reading books about uh, and chapters and articles about the uh, constitutional imaginaries of Weimar, socio-economic imaginaries behind European private law. There is a, a plethora of writings. However. Uh, until uh, Yiji's book, I must say that it was difficult for me to accept this notion because the authors were using the imaginary with a few footnotes here and there, but without a proper conceptual elaboration. And uh, this is the reason why I welcome very much Yiji's forthcoming book because it contains a proper philosophical, theoretical account of the notion of imaginary. And I'm starting to imagine how I could use it uh, myself, thanks to what you, uh, what you have provided. So uh, first of all, uh, I will start from the ontology of imaginaries, as I uh, reconstruct from your book. So the constitutional imaginary is a subtype of a social imaginary, which is defined by its subject matter which encompasses the entire polity and its subject. So it is the society itself. You introduce, uh, and I find it very uh, inspiring, this triad of potentia, potestas, auctoritas, and uh, the, you place the imaginary as this societal force, the potentia, which underlies, which is a certain substructure, fundament, uh, fundamentum uh, uh, over which the superstructure of potestas and auctoritas are built. But at the same time, and I think this is uh, crucial in your concept of the imaginary, you show that this ontology is, is not absolutist. It is, there is pluralism. Uh, so you say that they are multiple. They complement, but they conflict with each other. And secondly, that they are social constructs. They are not something which is given, but something which is produced within uh, discourse. Uh, secondly, so this would be the element of the ontology. Secondly, the element of the function. And uh, th this uh, part of the definition to me is very linked to your Luhmannian systems theory inspirations. And this, this will be one of my questions in a moment. So you define that their function is to operationalize the transvaluation of values and to represent the societal constitution of validity claims. In other words, the function, as I see it, is to forge the community, to forge the polity out of the functionally differentiated politics, law, the economy. So, uh, in, uh, to use perhaps an Aristotelian, uh, Aristotelian term, this uh, imaginary functions as a, as a form or soul which uh, provides the existence of the, of the body or, uh, or of the substance, the matter of so social life. And so without an imaginary, we cannot have a living polity. Uh, 
you also draw, and this is something which to me is uh, important because uh, being a critical legal scholar, I, I use the notion of ideology. And uh, many, some authors who are using the concept of imaginary are, I, I participate in a number of discussions trying to, to ask them to clarify this relationship. And my impression was sometimes that imaginary is just a different label for ideology because ideology is a term which obviously has Marxist implications, it's not fashionable, let's use imaginary, but the definition of imaginary provided by such people in the discussion when I finally pressed them was basically the same as ideology. Here you provide a very clear distinction as I see it. So you say that imaginaries do not belong to neither to the substructure of the material power nor to the superstructure of hegemonic ideology or symbolic order. And you also mentioned that they are more general than ideologies because they fu their function is not to legitimize the existing relations and institutions of political domination. And now let me move to the questions. So uh, my first uh, question would be, uh, would you perhaps uh, elaborate more broadly why you chose to, pre, to, to rely on Anderson and Taylor over Castoriadis and Lefort. How, and perhaps you could tell us something about your kitchen. How did you arrive at this specific understanding of an imaginary? What was the process of, the, of, of your intellectual uh, path which led you there? Secondly, I will, I will push you a bit more on the relationship between the imaginary and ideology. Because, of course, if we understand ideology as political ideology, like Michael Frieden does it, it this distinction that you use is obvious. Or if you use the, the Duncan Kennedy's concept of um, ideology as a universalization project. But if you, we would take uh, a definition of ideology which is dear to me, so the Althusserian one, as a system of representations endowed with a historical existence and role in a given society which sustains the uh, historical life of society is its essential structure, would there not be a certain overlap? And uh, if not, what uh, would be the relation in terms of the critical potential? Because the critical potential of the notion of ideology is well known. Would you tell, uh, but what about imaginary? Can you defend the concept of imaginary to the critical legal community? And this brings me to my final question. Do you think that it is possible to operationalize your concept of imaginary without the systems theory assumptions? So uh, can you advise this as a universal methodological tool or rather one which is uh, inherently linked to Luhmann's systems theory? Thank you. Okay, so uh, we're going to collect the questions by the panel, and also this does not mean that the audience is not allowed or supposed to ask questions. So if there is anyone in the audience who would like to join this ideological critique of uh, constitutional imaginaries. No, okay, so Petra. Okay, so now it's my turn. Um, um, uh, I know that we have five minutes, so I have to speak really quickly. <laughs> okay, so uh, first I'd like to say that this is really a wonderful, valuable uh, sociological reinterpretation, reinterpretation of constitutionalism. I consider that really um, important contribution to the trend which sees constitutions not merely as legal limits on power, but uh, as a sort of dialectical outcome, so to speak, of uh, social, cultural, political forces, which they um, then frame and then also help to constitute. I uh, would like to say that Yiri's book uh, um, really inspired me and invited me to think about what all kinds of unities and orders uh, there are which underlie constitutional orders and what other imaginaries or, or whether we can also use the imaginaries that he describes um, uh, to resolve some, some very acute problems facing constitu contemporary uh, constitutional orders. So I am going to frame my comment as a sort of creative inspiration about how to use the framework to address some some um, uh, issues that I personally consider really uh, urgent for uh, constitutional theory and, and uh, constitutional orders uh, to address, yeah? 
So I'm basing uh, my uh, comment mo mainly on part two, which is called out of topos, demos, nomos, unity. Uh, I mean, here Yiri starts with uh, a suggestion um, that there is a classic imaginary behind a nation state that is uh, a polity unifying space, people, and laws. Um, I mean, the unity of topos, demos, and nomos, and that this unity informed the rise of modern nations as much as constitutional democratic statehood and its liberal and republican regimes. Um, and this, um, and that this imaginary of unity still persists uh, in current uh, globalized uh, society. Now, the, now um, the, the, the argument, yeah, the main point that Yiji makes is that uh, this imaginary of unity of topos, demos, and nomos is problematic. I mean, it's problematic um, um, most fundamentally because it does not solve the problem of legitimation of uh, legality. I mean, going back to these individual uh, unities, I mean, the, the state, uh, um, uh, the, uh, the state, I mean the unity uh, uh, of the uh, state as, as a specific, uh, which provides a specific you know, legal form uh, of uh, political organization which uh, supplies legally constituted uh, authority, um, uh, I mean can, can never solve uh, the problem of uh, state uh, as, a, as a legally constituted authority, can never solve the problem of legitimacy because of the tendency to subsume legitimacy to um, other logics that the state represents like administrative efficiency, instrumental reason, uh, shared history, and other substantive values, yeah? Uh, but regarding um, uh, demos, um, and, and uh, which is um, basically addresses the question of culture and, and, and a constant attempt to use culture to integrate laws and politics by a set of you know, foundational, fundamental uh, values. And that, of course, is a project that, can, that is doomed to failure because because of the social uh, differentiation and, and the fact of uh, cultural uh, plurality, yeah. So, so, so the constitutions, therefore, because uh, because of these uh, the the failures, the constant failures of these uh, of uh, of this unity, constitutions therefore internalize other imaginaries and knowledge regimes. And the main ones that he names in the book concern uh, social and moral plurality, administrative steering, economic prosperity, and social justice, yeah? And these, if we look at that from that perspective, these also make it possible to imagine constitutionalism without a polity state uh, and constitutions. Um, Okay, so um, I have uh, a couple of questions. Um, uh, these are sort of footnote questions, but uh, if time permits, I uh, uh, usually might uh, want to uh, address them. Uh, like on one hand, I was wondering if this imaginary of unity, like it is a mainly a redescription of historical processes of constitution making and state formation. Um, and uh, with that regard, I would uh, like to raise a question which States actually, does it apply to when we look at you know the global history and, for example, when we also consider like the global European history of colonialism, yeah? Um, or is are the, this, this unity is this more of a sort of reconstruction of some ideal type of a nation state or a critique of some paradigms of constitutional uh, theory? I think this is a, this I consider that as an important uh, clarification, uh, especially if we want to use it like. Uh, like uh, the, the previous comment mentioned, as, as a sort of critical tool to address some of these uh, uh, some of these uh, current issues in constitutional politics. Yeah, but my main question is. Are there other important aspects of this unity underlying constitutional orders which we need to also, you know, uh, conceptualize and, and problematize? Yeah, and especially given, you know, the current uh, uh, the current uh, moment, uh, a current moment of climate change, you know, environmental collapse uh, and um, uh, global inequality and so on. Yeah. So, so I think there is one unity which is not mentioned in the book and it concerns the unity of bordered territorially contiguous space and the very material order imposed on the territory. Yeah? This, this territorial unity uh, of material 
order. I think it's 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 a very important um, um, historical fact. Yeah, uh, it's a it's it's a way how we can uh, look at uh, you know existing uh, existing states and uh, um, existing uh, uh, political orders. It's a political unity of state rule of law, um, um, w which has this uh, dimension of the occupation of space and territorial control uh, of, uh, of geographic space and, and uh, natural resources. And it has a very material dimension of sovereign claim to own natural res resources and to redistribute and reallocate property rights. Yeah, I think, I mean, I hope that it's <laughs> nothing controversial to invoke uh, Schmidt's notion of nomos of the earth here. Um, and uh, his, his uh, interpretation of the notion uh, as, as the fact of a concrete order of the material use of space, I mean, appropriation of the space, distribution of land, material production, uh, and so on, yeah. And uh, I uh, always like wonder why this dimension is, is so neglected by constitutional <laughs> theorists, especially those who are concerned with sort of interdisciplinary inter interpretations of uh, constitutional history and constitutional uh, or redefinition of constitutional uh, uh, theories, yeah? But, but anyway, I mean, I really like, like your approach. And so following your approach, I, I think we can ask two main questions. Yeah? What are the most problematic aspects of this material territorial unity? What are the tensions? And secondly, what imaginaries there are, if any, which break this unity of spatial occupation and territorial control of resources by the state? Yeah? Which can we imagine and which, which should we cultivate? Yeah? Um, so as to the first question, I think r it really has to be acknowledged that nomos of the earth unity is a very tense uh, uh, unity. Yeah? There are internal tensions generated by always problematic distribution of property rights, class conflict, economic domination, exploitation, market expansion, and so on. But there's also uh, a you know, global external tension resulting from the fact that states have arbitrary borders created by historically unjust you know, processes of war, colonization, and so on. The fact that there's a, a radical global inequality of uh, resource holdings uh, that uh, different states arbitrarily you know, control uh, valuable natural resources, that states exploit parts of uh, you know, uh, global commons, you have important uh, uh, environmental uh, natural resources that they create uh, pollution yeah, and climate change. Uh, and, and other, just uh, many other global um, injustices which are generated by the fact that states control uh, resources and, and, and the powers that make decisions about resources are sometimes illegal or illegitimate uh, and so on. Yeah? So today, in light of climate crisis, environmental collapse, global resource inequality, the unity of state, its law, and its territorial control over resources is like absolutely untenable. Yeah. Uh, but coming back to second question, which imaginaries do we invoke to break this unity of spatial occupation and, and accumulation, exclusive accumulation of resources? Uh, are you, do you think that any of those that you name can, can be used and invoked? Like, for example, I don't know, human rights even maybe, yeah? Um, um, and yeah, I mean, going back to what you, uh, what you said at the very beginning, yeah? How do we imagine the voice of the environment as breaking this kind of unity, yeah? Thank you for a very thorough questioning of Viri's book. I'm sure he has a lot to digest. Um, Bart? Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to raise a question to uh, Jerry's new book. And I'm very honored to be one of the early readers of this uh, fascinating material. And as always, um, reading uh, Jerry's work is um, a mind blowing experience. So it's uh, demanding. It's challenging, but in the end, it's also rewarding. 
And I always have the feeling there are brilliant uh, parts in it and there are parts I simply don't understand. So perhaps my question comes out of ignorance, so please enlighten me and forgive me. Um, so I have prepared a question based on uh, the reading, my reading of the four, first four chapters. Um, and there is a deeper question behind my question, but I, after tonight, I was not that clear in my, in my head to formulate it properly, but it has something to do with your overestimation of the social force at the, at the cost of potestas and authority. And I suspect there's some kind of sociological romanticism in the end in, in your theory. Um, but I have to think about it and I will come back to it later, not today. Today I have a more standard theoretical question. So let's start. Uh, according to Jiri, social imagine imaginaries play a constitutive role in establishing validity. As he argues, validity claims are neither exclusively constituted through intrinsic, intrinsic values of the legal system, nor guaranteed by an ultimate principle and reason behind the construction of social reality. Values are generated and their validity depends on the social force of imaginaries, which thus normalize power structures in different social systems by describing them as part of the generally meaningful, accomplished, and a commonly shared reality, page nine. And it, this, form, this formula returns later on in the book as well. And, and of, uh, end of quote. I wonder uh, how an external sociological approach based on system theory is able to account for the normative dimension of validity. So applied to law, validity is not or not just a matter of which norms are being followed, but which norms have to be followed. So the question is what should, should count as law, not what is or what is seen as law. Uh, within the legal system, legal authorities, such as judges, use various formal or substantial standards to determine which claims are valid legal claims, for instance, compatibility with higher legal norms or human rights. So from an external sociological, sociological point of view, it may be observed that in social communication, claims are being made regarding the validity of certain norms. People may express various and conflicting normative expectations. However, how can it be established which expectations have to be honored and which not? If legal validity depends on the, quote, social force of imaginaries, end of quote, as Jerry argues, it is power in the sense of potentia. By the way, potentia is always corrected when I spell it as potential uh, in, in words. And this is also, I think, a nice sli uh, Freudian slip. So uh, if, it, um, if legal um, validity depends on the social force of imaginaries, it is power in the sense of potentia that ul ultima uh, ult ultimately decides upon legal authorization, authoritas. So validity seems to be reduced to sheer force. Which imaginary is more successful or powerful than others in normalizing power structures? Validity, validity is not a fact, albeit some, so, some facts may have a normative force, as Jelinek put it, but only if there is some higher norm um, that prescribes that they have to be taken into account um, following Kelsen. Um, I'm inclined f um, with, with um, Kelsen and Ross to see validity as essentially a normative phenomenon. So my question is, how can you account, Jerry, uh, for the normative dimension of validity within a, a system theory approach, critically critical or not, for, for the transition from facts to norms, from is to ought, that takes place whenever legal claims are being made about what the law is and why it should have authority? In other words, how can exactly potentia genera generate Autoritas. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Hello, Iji, once again. Thank you very much for, uh, for this invitation to be one of the panelists. And um, fortunately, and un or unfortunately, I'm the last speaker, so I will try to be a bit closer to the grant after such a great theoretical voices. And I would like to deal and w uh, when I started reading, mm, let's say, the, 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 the second part of your incoming book, 
about nationalism, nation state. I've been looking for some point of contact and fi fi finally we are in the city of Gellner and, and the city where Gellner raised, where Gellner and at the end of his life he set up the center for the studies on nationalism in, at, in CU. And what was very touchy for me was that you uh, this 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 points about the role of uh, nationhood in the legitimacy process and you mentioned Basques you mentioned Catalans you mentioned Scots that from one side they uh, formulate the strong demand of their own nationhood but from the other side they do not they uh, they still say okay but we want to stay we want to maintain our presence in the supranational structures. Uh, the Scottish example and last week events in Edinburgh were quite a good example. My, uh, my experience from Basque country shows the same and, and also that it's, it's, it's quite rooted. Neil McCormick and his uh, book uh, about the nationalism and the liberal democracy when he pointed out that there is no problem between uh, to, 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 to connect liberal democracy and, and, and the nation state. But from the other side, you also mentioned this fact of that the, 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 the main accents of the legitimacy are still in the, in the nationhood level, and and uh, fo and even follow and, and of course uh, I've been your student, you've been the supervisor of my master thesis, but, but but I'm still not Lumaniac, and 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 the 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 the, pr the, the problem is that. Um, for even following Gellner's philosophy, or this, what is happening at the political level? Um, well, actually, I represent the country where president said that no one in the foreign languages will tell us what, 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 how we should manage our our Polish problems or how we should solve our Polish problems. From the other side, uh, in this conflict with EU institutional conflict, we are the country which. Uh, politics from where, where, uh, where politics every week offers new definition of the rule of law and and the dealing with European institutions so uh, I would like to ask you about this aspect of legitimacy but at the different levels so at the moment we face in Central Europe uh, Bauman call it tribal reunion but also some uh, very uh, the domination of uh, political speech in terms of the national identity and uh, talking about the nationhood over the law. Law is once again instrumentalized. And, 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 what, and, and what touches me, I, actually I have to confess, I did some microsociological research last Wednesday with two Slovaks. And I asked them about Havel book. It, this, it was a book written in 1991, sorry for my Czech pronunciation. It was in Czech, Letni Przemitani, Summer Thoughts. Su uh, so uh, the, su the, su the summer diary and how to try to design in summer 1991 how we how Czechs and Slovaks should reconstitutionalize the federation. When if if the referendum uh, succeeded in terms of maintaining the federation, how the federation should be reconstitutionalized. And my Slovak colleagues told me we don't know this book. Who care what Havel thought in 1991? <laughs> and it was it was. They really didn't know that uh, about this book. Uh, they, they had no clue about this uh, Havel's offer, how the how the Czechoslovak Federation should be reconstitutionalized. And uh, so, once again, tribal reunion and, and and the legitimacy at the at the at the very very political aspect, very political orientation, and very political approach to the legitimacy. So, my question and 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 same same as Bart, I wanted to ask you about this togetherness and applicability of Podgorecki's dirty togetherness at the national level, but still I probably I have to rethink this question. Okay, you can you can answer if you know what I mean. I don't. So, uh, so but my second question is uh, much more closer to the grant. It's a, it's a question, can you imagine that one day the, uh, the relocation, because it, how the way how I read this chapter shows that there is some potential to relocate the legitimacy at the other level than the national one. But can you imagine this? Of course, at the moment that could be wish wishful thinking. And towards what conditions? Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much and um, uh, very briefly so that if we have some time then for general questions. Uh, 
uh, all these friends and colleagues are people I deeply admire and always listen to. And I know that I have to listen even more carefully after what uh, uh, they said about the text, about uh, um, the problems with the text, with the book. So very quickly to the questions, and I, I deeply appreciate uh, how, how carefully and insightfully you looked into uh, my attempt. Uh, Rafael, why Anderson and Taylor and not Castoriadis uh, or Lefort? Uh, exactly because in Castoriadis and Lefort I found traces of critical legal, uh, of critical theory, general critical theory, which I found problematic uh, as philosophical conceptualization of objectivity and truth. And uh, very quickly, and I will, this is like a caricature, if you were in Frankfurt uh, in the 20s, you would have uh, Hogheimer and Adorno on one side and Karl Mannheim on the other. They hated, they loathed uh, uh, Mannheim. And I think in the end, Mannheim was right. Truth is a socially constructed tool of communication rather than an objective philosophical category. I know I'm uh, heading for a problem right now, but this is simply what I followed and why I followed uh, um, uh, why I followed uh, uh, Anderson and Taylor, because Taylor is much more subtle, and he's a philosopher by nature, but there is basically the hermeneutical turn in Taylor's notion of social imaginaries, which is deeply missing in Adorno, in, uh, and uh, which is missing even in Castoriadis, uh, I'm afraid. Um, or I didn't find it there. Uh, so that explains why, uh, uh, why Anderson and Taylor and not Castoriadis, why imaginary and not ideology, this is uh, deeply uh, uh, connected, uh, because imaginary exactly is um, uh, uh, interpretive category rather than uh, a category of uh, ideology of, uh, uh, which, is, uh, which is tainted uh, too much by categories of truth and falsity. And uh, your amazing question about uh, uh, how can we use imaginaries if we are not systems theorists. Uh, yes, uh, we had long discussions with another person who I uh, didn't mention today, uh, with Paul Blocker, who was probably uh, the first person who found something interesting in my Dissidents of Law, uh, uh, published it, uh, almost 20 years ago, and the first monograph in English. And he exactly extracted this uh, uh, idea of legitimation as a never-ending open process which cannot be grasped, fully grasped and comprehended by legality. And so imaginaries uh, are Oper uh, uh, it's not about operationalization of imaginaries, it's about seeing imaginaries as operations, okay? This brings me to uh, Petra's, uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, questions. Uh, I, I already uh, tried to answer, and, and, and you, Petra, you beautifully um, uh, captured uh, my uh, uh, idea that legitimacy cannot be resolved by legality. And uh, this is this, uh, which states uh, does it apply to? You asked uh, very, very provocatively. And, uh, and, and of course, if you happen to live in to Europe, and you have this modern nation, uh, nation building, state building, you have a very, very specific concept of how states are constituted, how nations are constituted, and how law is instrumentalized, something that Philip uh, said at the end, in, in this process. And, uh, and of course, if you end up um, in uh, the United Kingdom, or um, that part of the United Kingdom which was colonized in Middle Ages, um, you, you, you see, you realize that um, uh, the states 
don't have to be nation states or we uh, we talk about whenever we say nation in britain we have so many different uses and meanings for it yeah we talk about britishness of course we are four nations uh, at the same time our nation one many and we know that uh, uh, we uh, uh, may uh, lose uh, uh, some parts but we will still be considered a very sovereign country even and uh, the problem today uh, Philip as you said is not Scottish nationalism it's Anglo nationalism one fifth of English inhabitants think that Scots should go if, if it reminds you the situation in Czechoslovakia in 1991-92, this you're absolutely uh, right. So um, your central question, Petra, about material territorial unity, you're absolutely right. You know, I'm uh, <laughs> everything I write. For me, Schmidt is not a nemesis. For me, Schmidt is the most fascinating. Uh, theorist who got the concept of sovereignty completely wrong because he limited it to the executive power and who got the concept of nation completely wrong because he, con uh, he connected it to concrete specific existence rather than social construct because we know that nations can be uh, constructed, reconstructed and reimagined. Yeah? The reimagination of the German nation is one of the most fascinating stories to be said uh, uh, in the last 70 years. And, um, uh, but I completely agree with you that, uh, and that this materiality is the way to give some voice. Uh, and materiality is probably uh, not a solution, but uh, it's one of potentials how to give voice to environmental crisis. It's us already. Environmental is speaking to, environment is always speaking to us. The question is how we understand and how we imagine this. Yeah? Uh, but uh, sociological romanticism, I will be leaving uh, this building and thinking, well, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a new romantic, I'm an old romantic now, but sociological romantic sounds absolutely correct. Yeah, you absolutely spotted uh, my own, um, uh, uh, my own, uh, I don't want to say ethos, but, uh, um, mm, how my mind operates. <laughs> yeah. And uh, uh, when you say normative validity, how is this from is to ought, then? How is all authority generated? And yes, I'm afraid I would have to answer, it is always generated from within the uh, legal system, from within the political system. It's not some voice of the people out there, existential. No, there is no existential answer to our legal and political question. It's always already constituted uh, internally by the system of constitutional law, by the system of uh, democratic or authoritarian politics, any politics. Okay. Uh, again, yeah, absolutely essential question. Finally, Philip, <laughs> why Gellner? Uh, I think Ernest, Ernest Gellner made this wonderful comment about the basic mistake of Marxism. That the basic mistake of Marxism was that they believed that the world will globalize itself. Yeah? This is this, this early idea of liquid modernity or modernity as liquidity. It's not Zygmunt Bauman, of course, it's the Communist Manifesto. And they believed that nations will uh, melt like the capitalism and we will establish global socialist utopia. And the basic mistake was that 20th century wasn't the century of proletariat revolution. It was the century of heavy nationalism 
and nationalist extremes. Uh, after all, um, uh, the question you can ask, as some historians ask, was St uh, Stalin's version of socialism was a national version of socialism. It was a kind of national socialism. So Gellner, for me, is fascinating and very inspiring because he grasped, in, in Czech, nationalism is called národní obrození. Yeah, this obrození, renewal, is actually like you invite the nation to awake from its sleep, as if the nation was sleeping like those uh, knights in the Blanik mountain, and you, re uh, you awake them and say, come on, wake up. Rapunzel or uh, Sleeping Beauty. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, my kids are too old now. I'm, I'm starting to mess up uh, fairy tales. Uh, so, uh, uh, wake up, Cinderella. Uh, no, Cinderella is not sleeping. <laughs> sleeping Beauty. It's, it's really my senior moment here. Um, and uh, so, I, I will stop uh, talking about fairy tales. Um, and uh, your comment on Havel. Uh, I think Havel's Letní přemítání is a deeply problematic book, and I'm saying it as a British understatement now. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a book of failure, and it's a book in which uh, the core concept is called authentic federation. Yeah, every time you invite authenticity to communicate the language of politics, you're heading for trouble. Yeah, it's. Uh, and uh, after my criticism of Marxism and critical theory, let me finish on a conciliatory note. As Theodor Wiesegrund Adorno would say, the jargon of authenticity. Yeah? So I think this book suffers from the jargon of authenticity, and that's why uh, uh, it was uh, misunderstood what the Slovak aspirations and Czech aspirations had been at the time. And still, uh, it was unnecessary. It, was, it could be saved. Um, um, uh, former Czech prime minister, now um, distinguished, uh, he's not professor, is he? But why should he be professor at Charles University? He is one of the most important minds in this country. Petr Pidhart, when he was prime minister, was calling for dvojdomek, semi-detached house of Czechs and Slovaks. Yeah? At the time, because everything was rights return to Europe, uh, market uh, transformation, let's not wait for Slovaks if they want their statehood. Today, we, if you look around, we have so many semi-detached houses or a permanent crisis of nationalism, and still the countries can live together. And uh, so it was perhaps a missed opportunity and authentic federation didn't help. But I should stop here. Okay, thank you very much. Now the floor is open for questions from the audience. Yes, I... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. I haven't read your, your book yet, but I found your talk very inspiring, so definitely I will. Uh, so I was, when I was listening to you, I was wondering um, what to do in a, such a situation when we have uh, competing different uh, social imaginaries within one society. So for instance, uh, a secular versus religion-based, uh, cosmopolitan versus national one. So can we consider law as an instrument uh, to overcome the clash of these imaginaries on a meta level? Or not really, because, as you said, actually law inv involves a certain social imaginary itself. So what, what to do to overcome uh, such a situation? Thank you. Are there any more questions from the audience? OK, Yiri. Maybe I, I was wondering whether you wanted to also elaborate on populist imaginaries a bit. Yeah. Yes, competing imaginaries, they are definitely conflicting, competing, and that's um, uh, one of the arguments in the book is uh, that uh, these imaginaries uh, cannot be 
crafted by some political will. That's why they are part of societal potentia. Yeah? But the potentia is in society, and Barth was absolutely right when he said there is an element of romanticism, because I wouldn't go, for instance, in the direction of argument of philosophers like Giorgio Agamben, who takes uh, Spinoza and uh, uh, makes potentia, and his difference between potentia and potestas into potential, potentialities, yes, the book on potentialities. So uh, this is not about the instrumentalization of uh, imaginaries. Imaginaries are not a matter of political will, of collective decision making, or um, a national self-understanding, some collective self-understanding. They are, in my book, definitely, they are internal um, uh, constructs of uh, uh, functionally differentiated systems. And uh, when you ask about this competition and whether law can be a meta-imaginary, no, it cannot. It is just one of imaginaries. Yeah? And we could see it, uh, it, 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 it is revealed uh, during the time of crisis. For instance, what is the founding idea or imaginary of um, Europe as community of the rule of law? Of course, we know it wasn't like this at the beginning, yeah? that this was gradually evolving and uh, constituted throughout the 60s and reinterpretation of the treaty as if it were some constitution. So. Um, uh, uh, it's, um, uh, uh, but uh, but uh, at the moment of crisis, the Eurozone crisis, and law is completely set aside. So the imaginary of the rule of law is sidelined by the fact, I will do whatever it takes. Is it the state of exception, the Draghi moment, yeah? and uh, uh, save, save the Euro moment? Yeah? And uh, um, how can you legitimize it? Because we have the rule of law as uh, the leading principle. And now you have the situation of lawlessness. And you have the, the situation of crisis, deep monetary crisis. And it is being resolved by an economic technocratic decision, which nevertheless has profound political implications. If national governments are being formed and dismantled by the Troika, as happened during the Euro crisis, what is left there for the modern uh, uh, imaginary of nation state? Yeah? So law is one of imaginaries of self-constituted European society, and that's why I'm careful in uh, formulating that this legal system cannot be based by some basic norm, uh, but it can be only constitutional pluralism of Europe. Um, it's, uh, your question goes into um, uh, a more general question. Is there any ultimate legitimizing imaginary of society, whether it's European or global. And of course, it's not. This is, this is the basic um, uh, argument of societal constitutionalism, and my book has a subtitle, uh, uh, um, a Theory of European Societal Constitutionalism, that by definition, these constitutions are functionally differentiated. They are not normatively unified and integrated through law. So law is important, but only as functionally differentiated specific system. Okay. Are there any more questions for our guest? Okay, guys, we are slightly behind the schedule. So thank you very much, Jerzy, for your presentation. Thank you very much for your questions. Thank you very much for the invitation and for absolutely terrific comments, which will fill me with uh, thoughts for next couple of weeks. Thank you. Coffee break, uh, room number 38. Musím začít předpisovat tu knihu, no, to je blbý. Já už knihu žádnou psát nebudu, protože, hele...
to už nemá smysl dneska. To jsou, to jsou, to jsou book depozitories. Oni ti to vydají, no. oni ti to vydají, všechno, všechno dneska vydají, hmm. ale vydají ti to tak, že prostě ti to hodí do toho jejich yes. katalogu hmm. a kdo chce, tak si to elektronicky stáhne, že jo. A jako smyslně občas nějaký článek. Není promoušet, no, já, už, no, já už to, já už, já už jsem starý muž, starý bílý heterosexuální muž, který skončil. Ty lidi taky, taky s tím začnu něco dělat, já už jsem... Ty můžu dát školení v nějaký no, no, ty, ty, jsi, ty, tady, ty tady rozvracíš morálku a vláde, že jo, prostě Aga, Aga si myslí, že prostě všichni, že všichni budou, všichni budou...